So first I'm gonna be talking about what the big picture goal is of all this. Why are we here? Why have we all gathered, woken up at really early times or up really late on other continents? Um, why, why have we gathered for this? And then I'll move into sort of the ABCs of physical cosmology, providing sort of a landscape of roughly the last hundred years of how cosmology has evolved and basically what we think the, the, the paradigm is for today. What most scientists agree on is the picture for physical cosmology. Um, and that picture in and of itself is replete with holes, both empirically and philosophically and are causing some consternation against for some of the sort of the heavy hitters in cosmology. And this is causing a resurgence in what are called cyclic models of the universe in cosmology. Um, so these types of models were kind of dead about 20 years ago or so, um, but the current standard Big Bang model has issues and it's causing a lot of people to really think hard about how to resolve these issues. And one of the main avenues out of that appear to be cyclic models of cosmology. And this has led to a lot of different ideas. So I won't touch on all of those, but I'll just show what is happening right now, generally in cosmology. Regardless of any of that, there's gonna be a limit to this physicalist approach. Um, I'll delve into that a lot more. I'm kind of preaching to the choir on this one, but I'll be discussing and trying to prove why there is a limit to any physical cosmological model to try and have a comprehensive framework of the cosmos. Um, so our goal is gonna be um, building a comprehensive concordance model of cosmology, including consciousness as Brahma Tirtha alluded to. And this is a pretty big task, but we'll move incrementally as science does. So onto the big picture goal, well, we can see it right here um, on the website. We have our devotee scientist, Morali Gopal, bravely talking to one of, one of the great philosophers, David Chalmers. And whether or not you agree with the exact wording of the mission statement, um, the BI is a center for research and dissemination of a non-mechanistic view of reality with the main purpose of the Institute to explore the implications of Bhagavad Vedanta philosophy as it bears upon human culture and to present it in, in such things as conferences and workshops like this. Um, and one of the keys that I'll talk about more is that the BI is building intellectual bridges and creating joint research paths. So the devotee community interacting with the larger scholarly community um, in terms of metaphysical, cosmological, and cultural descriptions of India's Bhagavad Vedanta tradition. Um, so Cosmo 3 for us is just another stepping stone after Cosmo 1 and 2, um, and it's our way of devotee scientists, the non-scientists, getting together to make tangible contributions to a larger framework for how we can explain cosmology and the integration of consciousness. Um, and in that regard, we need to be able to speak the language of academia. Right, So we need to be able to present this in such a way that will ultimately attract people to bhakti. Um, so developing this model, um, in our view, is gonna be something that will be rigorous both mathematically and incorporate an experiential framework with consciousness playing an integral role. We know that quantum mechanics demands the role of the observer in consciousness. And as we at the universe, especially the very early universe in cosmogenesis, quantum mechanics is what's dominant at that epic, and consciousness is absolutely central to that. Um, so that will be part of, of developing a model that we all generally agree upon. Um, there may be some slight disagreements, but we need to come up with a general framework that we can work with. And Brahmatirta alluded to this, but this is absolutely an interdisciplinary collaboration. It's not just scientists tinkering away with their theories on cosmology. It takes kind of all hands on deck. This is, um, we need the historians, philosophers, uh, cosmologists, quantum physicists, whoever we can get in the devotee community working together on this. Um, I, can, I can think back 
when I was in graduate school, if you're in the physics department, you stay in the physics department. In fact, I don't think I entered any other building on campus. Um, but for us, it's inherent in, a, in, in our discourse that it's inter interdisciplinary. Um, and from my perspective, that means not everyone has to be an expert in cosmology um, or even an expert in Shastra, but at least know the landscape of both. <laughs> expert in the former, so I rely on others that are more expert in the latter. Some of you are quite expert in both. Um, and Parma Karuna will talk about this a little bit later about developing um, a database um, with, with uh, filled with basically stuff from Shastra that a scientist could go and, and pick out um, and grab useful information from. These kinds of things are extremely important. Looks like Edwin Bryant wants to go. Okay, so the cyclic universe. The question is, who cares? Why do we care about this? It seems so esoteric. We're, we have bills to pay. We have, you know, cars that need to be fixed. We have families to take care of. Why should we care about a universe that may just inflate forever or contract or something? What does that, what does that matter? Um, well, I'm going to argue that cosmology is of particular importance. It's an incredibly special science because it, it's sort of the physical situation that provides the context for human life. It's a physical science, but it's directly related to human existence. Um, so in, in that way, um, yeah, I, it, 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 plays a central role, but it also will tell you as all cosmology, just in itself, just in physical cosmology, there's gonna be a limit to the scope of what it can explain. Um, and these ideas of um, the importance of human existence within the larger scope of cosmology, like the fine tuning problem and the anthropic principle that we're all familiar with. So in other words, if we're sticking, sticking to language of physics, we have the cosmological constant, the gravitational constant, the mass of the electron, whatever. Um, if any of those are slightly changed at all, none of us are sitting in this room aware of the universe, right? So, so we know that is often an argument used on the theist side of the importance um, in the anthropic principle. On the other side, um, recent polling has been done I don't quote me the exact numbers, but roughly 70% of cosmologists um, firmly believe in the idea of a multiverse that is uh, a result of the, the main um, inflationary model of, of the Big Bang. So that implies that there is an infinite number of universes. Well, if there's an infinite number of universes, then of course you're gonna have one like this that has conscious life. So in their mind, that washes away the whole problem of fine tuning, which of course is kind of ridiculous. This idea of a multiverse is inherently not falsifiable. It's not explanatory um, and it's kind of junk science. Um, so uh, I would say in the word, there's um, John Pilkinghorn, if you know him, he's an Anglican priest and physicist. Um, he calls this meta science where um, science is going beyond the bounds of what it's meant to do. It's, it's relying on something that inherently, that inherently is not falsifiable. Um, and devotees are happy to go beyond science, and we should, um, but scientists sticking to the multiverse are kind of, as Rudayan Andamar would say, are getting out of their lane. So this is kind of the cartoon picture, how I see it. You have a scientist saying, okay, fine. Um, you can say the multiverse is something that's not falsifiable, great. Well, all you ever do is say, okay, fine, well then God just did it. That's your explanation. That's academically lazy. It's not explanatory. Um, and I, I picture our little devotee friend here saying, well, yes, God did it and here's how. And we actually have a framework that can provide. Uh, obviously that's a lofty goal, but in general, integrating consciousness into these holes in the, cosmo in the modern cosmological model, I think is crucial. Um, 
I want to just provide a little anecdote. Just, you know, we don't have to be so serious and stuffy when we give all these talks. Back in graduate school, I had been thinking about this a lot some 10, 15 years ago. And I submitted a paper. There's, there's a database where astrophysicists and cosmologists and others submit their papers um, for the larger community to look at. It's either papers that have been accepted by a journal or submitted to a journal. And you get feedback and discourse and that kind of thing. It's just an archive online. And I submitted this paper called On the Anthropic Principle in the, in the Multiverse, Addressing Provability and Tautology. And it has this um, really sort of smart looking abstract with fancy words and stuff. Um, but if you actually look closer and you weren't one of those people that sent an incredibly vitriolic email to me without ever reading it, you would notice that, oh, it looks like he's doing some fancy stuff with all these equations. But this is an interesting graph. It says acronym cleverness versus number of citations. <laughs> so in physics, the, the more clever the name of your experiment, the more number of citations you might get. Um, and if you looked even closer, you might know, always have these subject headings. So these are kind of like your keywords for what your paper is. And the first letter of each word spells out April Fool's. So I submitted this on April 1, 2010, <laughs> as a total joke. No one thought it was a joke. It just goes to show that they didn't actually read it. They just got really fired up that I was sort of going on some theistic rant. Um, so anyways, maybe I was an aspiring devotee back then. I didn't even know it. Um, OK, so um, what was that? All right, so let's get in ABCs of physical cosmology today. Um, talk about the epistemology of cosmology. How do, I, how do we know what we know in modern cosmology? This will segue nicely into Krishna talk, um, where he will talk about the epistemology more in the Vaishnav canon. Really looking forward to that. So when we're doing cosmology, we have to know what, what is actually the first principles of when we're doing any kind of science in this regard. So one is we extrapolate the local to the cosmological. And what do I mean by that? Well, in the lab, you can test things like atomic physics, quantum physics, you can measure gravity, you can do these sorts of things. Um, and basically we take those laws and we extend them to say that they exist everywhere in the cosmos in the same way. It's a reasonable starting place, but it is an assumption. And unlike most scientists or, or, or other fields of science, cosmology is unique in that we only have one thing to study in its class. If you're studying human populations, you know, you have lots of humans and different individuals, you can see how things vary. We just have one universe. We can't compare it to another. You can't juggle parameters, tweak this over here and do that. You just have the one to work with. Um, except the caveat in the theorist's mind because they'll come up with anything. And then most importantly is what's so called, called the so-called cosmological principle. And the details are incredibly important, but again, these are the foundations for saying what we know in cosmology. And the first on the left-hand side is what's called uh, the principle of isotropy. And that is on very large scales of the universe, there's no preferred direction. If you, whatever direction you look in, it's kind of the same. So there's no preferred location in the universe. And second is the idea of homogeneity. Everything in the universe is kind of spread out in the same way. There's nothing, there's no special place or anything. On large scales, it's filled with the same stuff. It kind of looks the same. Um, and that's the starting point for doing any sort of cosmology on large scales. Okay, good. So I'm gonna start about a hundred years ago. I'm gonna go quickly through that because Steve today will be talking a lot about the history of science, but I just need to plug first um, that we're going from Hubble the man to Hubble the telescope. So Edwin Hubble, the former all-American basketball star at University of Chicago, who became a famous astronomer is shown here at Mount Wilson. And back in his time in the 1920s, we lived in the Milky Way galaxy and that was it. That was the universe. And around it were these kind of faint, fuzzy little nebulous things. Um, 
that of course everyone thought were within our own galaxy. But his observation showed that these were way too far away to actually, and not only that, they were rushing away from us at incredible speeds, such that the farther they were from us, the faster they were moving. And this was the first discovery that we weren't our own little island universe, that there were other galaxies and that the universe was expanding. This was absolutely revolutionary. And then fast forward to the 90s and we had the Hubble Space Telescope. So this is um, a telescope that was in orbit around Earth. And I wanna show you in particular, one fascinating thing, you might've seen this called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. So imagine, hold on. Okay, there I was. Okay, um, I may have to speed through a little bit of stuff, but here, um, what you can see is that as, as this space telescope is orbiting, do me a favor and imagine something here. So imagine sticking your thumb out to the sky and taking a picture the size of your thumbnail. This is what the Hubble Space Telescope did for the equivalent of an 11-day exposure as it orbited around Earth, just one patch of sky about that size. And what it showed was in that little patch, there were about 10,000 galaxies. Okay, so take that idea and extrapolate it to the entire full 360 view of the universe. And we're talking trillions of galaxies. So this was another major revolution in our understanding of the cosmos. Um, hopefully these videos won't keep lagging, but we'll charge on. Um, so I'll just kind of skip over this really quickly. It's not of utter importance, but it's just to show that there are a lot of other missing features that we don't understand in cosmology as of yet. So if you look at what's called the sort of the pie chart of the, of, of the energy density of the universe, the vast majority of it is in this stuff we call dark energy that's causing the expansion of the universe to accelerate um, about 27%. These numbers change from time to time um, is what we call dark matter discovered back in the 70s. Um, it's basically a type of matter that we don't understand. We don't know what it is. We know how it behaves and it doesn't interact with light. It just interacts through the force of gravity. And then and so in the universe, only about 5% of it is stuff made of, say, atoms, visible matter, like this table and all of us that we can see. So this is kind of a standard picture of the historical timeline of the universe. On the far right-hand side, we're at the present day, and that's kind of showing where we have, this isn't to scale, um, the universe has expanded and gotten much larger than it was previously but you have sort of this expanded um, acceleration of space. And we have galaxies, our own galaxies, um, everything we know about um, the current state of the universe. As we travel back in time to the left, you'll notice um, this faint sort of picture, oh, there's a cursor working, um, right here. Um, Bhupal Dave will talk about this more. This is what's known as the cosmic microwave background. And it's what it's allowed us to piece together the full history of the cosmos. So basically what happens, we know that the universe is expanding. Logically, you would think, well, in the past, it was going in the other direction. It was, it was getting smaller. It was smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and as you get more compactified and the universe is hotter and denser, um, light cannot actually escape from atoms. But as it gets a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, it starts to cool down. And at this very particular time, about 400,000 years after whatever this event was, um, photons can now escape from nuclei and are free to spread throughout the universe. And this is called the cosmic microwave background. Um, this is a picture of it. It's, it's a whole, um, the full 360 degree view of the sky. And this is basically the temperature of the universe. Um, it's showing uh, what, the, basically the relic universe after the Big Bang. It's kind of a fossil record of what the early universe looked like. And this was a wild success for physical cosmology. It was predicted, it was expected, and it fit a lot of the, the theories of Big Bang inflation. Um, so Bhupal will talk more about this. All I'm gonna say here is that basically the early universe was incredibly smooth in temperature and matter, et cetera. And we have 
very, very detailed observations of this. And it allows us to connect, to connect what happened in the very distant past to what we know today. So by and large, from about 400,000 years after some event, we can call it the Big Bang if you like, until now, cosmologists generally agree about what's going on. But if we go back to this picture, before this time, the only way we can really probe it is by, is by doing stuff in the laboratory. Because as the universe gets smaller and smaller, it starts to get to temperatures and energy scales that are just unfathomably large. So particle accelerators like CERN and those sorts of things um, can try and simulate these conditions, but only down to like a certain energy scale. There's a point beyond which we actually can't really test in the lab. Um, so then we're left thinking, okay, what, what happened before this time? This roughly is at these particle accelerators or testing conditions down to about 10 to the minus 12 seconds after something happened. Call it a big bang, time equals zero, whatever. We'll get to that. Um, but we don't know anything before that. It's pure speculation. So as the universe gets really small and really small and compactified, um, it's no longer gravity that's dominating on large scales. We're at small scales where quantum mechanics is what is, where is what is dominating. Um, and that's a funny, strange world when you get to that size. And like I was saying before, consciousness can play a crucial role in what's going on in the world of quantum mechanics. So our theories generally break down. Physics breaks down when you get to these really small scales. So if we're interested in cosmogenesis, what happened toward the beginning of time, or at, let's just say time equals zero for now, um, physics breaks down. So now we have a picture of some universe where some event happened. It expanded rapidly in this period called inflation, and then will continue to expand. But these issues with, say, the multiverse and other things that we can't probe about the standard model of cosmology is that other scenarios might be going on. One of those might be, well, it gets so big that ultimately all the matter in the universe causes it to collapse back down. These sorts of models were ruled out um, some 20 years ago or more. These are you know, the so-called big crunch models. Um, but there's been a real resurgence in this type of thinking, and I'll tell you why. So a lot of really, really um, important thinkers in the field of cosmology are very uncomfortable with this um, idea of a multiverse and inflation. Um, and they started thinking a little bit out of the box. And we're not just talking about um, grad students twiddling away in their cubbies writing down theories. These are, these are Nobel laureates that are very unhappy and unsettled with what is commonly accepted as the concordance model in cosmology. So this has led to people thinking more about how we can resolve these sorts of these issues inherently that are empirically challenging and in a sense fault, um, not falsifiable and philosophically very troubling. Um, so these have led to new types of cyclic cosmological models. And there are a lot of them. And this wasn't really around at all when I was in grad school. We're just talking the last few years where these have um, sort of resurfaced in new and exciting ways. This is just showing you know, a collage of some of these. Um, Gopal will be talking about one in particular that is, that is quite interesting. Um, so a few highlights. Uh, there's there's the, the Nobel laureate, Sir Roger Penrose's uh, conformal cyclic cosmology. I think we should pay attention to this one. Gopal will argue that you know, it doesn't quite match our view so far of the pariah cosmology but it's got some very interesting insights that we should be aware of. Um, so stay tuned for his talk. I think that's gonna be a really good one. Um, and then there are other ones that are uh, very cleverly designed such that when the universe was, uh, there was a, an epoch before our own universe that underwent a period of contraction, it sort of smoothed down and then expanded into a new universe that we have today. 
Um, it's with rather simple and elegant arguments and gets around a lot of the problems. Doesn't even involve something like inflation or anything like that. Um, it's a very beautiful physical model. Um, these are just to highlight a few, but there are a lot out there um, and they're gaining a lot of traction. So that's, that's good for us because we like cyclic models and these just weren't a thing 10 years ago and are now are, are taken very seriously. Okay, so regardless of those, whichever one I just showed you, um, these guys at Princeton, Roger Penrose, um, no matter what they come up with, and even admittedly by them, there's a limit to this. You can write down all the physical mechanisms you want, but you can't explain why the universe started, how it started. Um, you can just try and explain away how it's working um, basically since sometime after the Big Bang. So here, here's a, a guy I really respect and like. He worked um, down the road for me at Fermilab when I was at Chicago, Don Lincoln. He's got some great YouTube videos that I suggest you watch if you just want sort of popular um, cosmology videos that are easy, easily digestible. So here, here is a prominent physicist admitting exactly what we're talking about. He says, we have data after about 10 to the minus 13 seconds after this so-called singular event, but nothing before. And we think that physics breaks down at around a certain time. So the truth is, he's being honest, we don't know. We don't know what happens. Um, at, uh, at pre-Big Bang. So what does the universe look like at time equals zero? These are his words, not mine. The scientists don't know. And they're very forward in saying that, not all of them. Um, so we need, we need to move to a different paradigm. So some people have tried some fancy ways to go across this boundary, which we're saying where physics breaks down. This is called kind of the Planck era. Um, where uh, quantum mechanics and gravity, everything goes haywire. And they've tried to come up with ideas about how going trans Planckian past this, when the idea is really that we need to go to something more transcendental. So clever things have been come up with, like uh, I'll just briefly state these. It doesn't matter the details, but the so-called um, hartle hawking state where um, Basically what Hawking alludes to, you may have heard this idea before, is that if you go to this very early universe state, let's say close to time equals zero, and someone asks, when did the universe start? He gives the analogy of an explorer going to the South Pole and arriving there. And then someone else getting there and saying, which way is South? The idea being, what is time and space at this epoch? is a question that doesn't even make sense. It's not even worth asking, it's relevant. So that's some word, word jugglery to get around what actually happens back then. And then you'd also see this really popular notion of how you can get a spontaneous universe from nothing. And, and we should be very careful about understanding what is meant by nothing. Nothing just means the vacuum of space, but that's something, and that something has to be caused by something else. So these are attempts, um, and I would argue feeble ones. And so this, this quote, I think, sums it up just so nicely, and I'll, and I'll, I'll read it for you. So it says, do, do advances in modern physics and cosmology help us, well, I can't see what it says under there, address these underlying questions of why there is something called the universe at all, and why there are things called the laws of physics and why those laws seem to take the form of quantum mechanics and why some particular wave function. In a word, no, I don't see how they could. And this is from one of the most uh, preeminent thinkers and physicists, Sean Carroll, basically admitting we do physics and we'll keep doing it because it's fun and exciting, um, but it, it ultimately can't provide the comprehensive picture that we're looking for. So our goal, um, again, is a big one, but I think in, in the way science works, this will be incremental. Um, we keep doing these workshops, we keep getting new ideas, forming new groups, and we keep working towards a more comprehensive picture of cosmogenesis. Um, so again, this requires 
well, it absolutely necessitates interdisciplinary collaboration. It's not something that just myself or Akal Saroop or Gopal or Morali Gopal or someone that are just scientists can figure out. Um, everyone needs to be working on trying to, to put together a picture based on a Puranic cosmological model or, or maybe beyond the Puranas if need be um, that invokes the metaphysical as well as Brahmacharya was talking about. And this is just required inherently by the limits of physicalism. So some sort of new consciousness matter interface is what we're looking for. Because this, these stringing of, of different universes one after another um, need further explanation than just the laws of physics that are built on their own inherent assumptions. And a lot of work has been done so far. Um, I refer you to Akhandi's Atma Paradigm. This is kind of my own little take on something he presented. In particular, if you go to his fourth uh, chapter, I guess I would say, sixth and seventh video, um, he talks about a, a really um, interesting framework for causation from a quantum to classical transition. Um, so a lot of people out, out there, you guys are thinking hard about this. Um, and we need to start sort of putting our minds together, putting pen to paper. Um, and in that way, I would say, we're not saying, you know, throw science out the door. I'm saying we can use modern physical cosmological models as inspiration. Again, going to Gopal's talk, he'll show a very elegant cyclical model. And though it may differ from one that we may interpret from the Bhagavatam, for instance, um, there's insight to be gained there and maybe inspiration to be gained. Um, this happens in other fields. So one of the um, preeminent physicists who founded uh, loop quantum gravity, very sort of esoteric thing, Lee Smolin um, got very interested in the field of biology and he applied basically principles of natural selection to how a universe could be cyclic in nature. Basically, uh, in, a, in a nutshell, if you take a black hole, um, you know, it, at, at the end of the black hole, they say there's some singularity. Well, that, there aren't really singularities in nature. The singularities point to a breakdown in our physical theories. And Smolin and others suggest that that actually gives birth to a new universe on the other side. And things propagate based on fitness and natural selection based on black holes. And the more black holes you have, the more universes you'll create. Details don't matter. Point is he's grabbing inspiration from somewhere else, seeing where that inspiration leads him. But I would say, let's please proceed cautiously. Again, we're trying to do a rigorous mathematical and experiential framework. So to, to paraphrase the physicist, and metaphysicist David Bohm, beware of these false insights. I'll give a, a tentative example. So imagine our, our black hole here and Sidori is headed towards this black hole. He lives in our regular space and time, but there's kind of this horizon, this boundary where things start to get really strange. Space and time start to really get weird. And then he crosses this boundary and goes into some realm we don't really understand. Well, you can see online and in other places, people say, oh, well, that's like you're in Brahma Loka and space and time get weird. And then you leave there and you hit this shell, this boundary, it's a transition to the spiritual world. And then space and time as you know it are not like you knew it before or they don't exist at all. Um, and that's a neat idea, um, but analogies and metaphors only go so far. Um, we need to have you know, a rigorous framework for this. Also, another thing you'll read about uh, frustratingly online is parallels between the, the innumerable universes in the Bhagavatam and just the buzzword of a multiverse and saying, this is, oh, that's what it is, it's that. Um, the multiverse can mean a lot of things in science. So we can't just quickly say, oh, it looks like that, it's probably that. Um, it really requires some very in-depth study. Um, and uh, oh, I'll forget about the quantum mechanics. I'll go off on a tangent on that. But um, I just wanted to end with with a, with a quote that I think is is really beautiful. And this is from Sataputta. 
um, in his book, God and Science. He says, the theory of creation by sound vibration involves transcendental levels of reality, not accessible to the mundane senses. And thus in one way, it is more unverifiable than the purely physical Darwinian theory. However, if a purely physical theory turns out to be empirically unverifiable, then there's nothing further one can do to be sure about it. Of course, the dynamics of obtaining such knowledge are different from those of empirical experimental science and mathematical analysis. Instead of forcing nature to disclose its secrets, one surrenders to the Supreme Lord in a humble spirit and pursues a path of spiritual discipline and divine service. Thanks. Um, Thank you.